Right now, the Senate racing to pass a crucial debt ceiling bill. That bipartisan deal cleared the House last night. That, of course, after months of infighting and often bitter negotiations. The final tally, though, look at this 314 to 117. 149 Republicans and 165 Democrats voted yes in favor. 71 Republicans and 46 Democrats voted against. Senators must follow suit by Monday, or the Treasury Department says America could start defaulting on some of its bills. The Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer then telling the chamber this morning, buckle up. Time is a luxury the Senate does not have. Any needless delay or any last minute holdups would be an unnecessary and even dangerous risk. And any change to this bill that forces us to send it back to the House would be entirely unacceptable. It would almost guarantee default. Here in studio to share their reporting and their insights, CNN's Melanie Zanona, Tolo Olorunipa of The Washington Post, and Margaret Taleb of Axios. Uh, so walk us through this. Explain to America how Washington and the <laughs> Senate works. Senator Schumer, Senator McConnell have an agreement. Some senators will get to propose amendments as yeah. long as they can kill them. Exactly. As long as they make sure they lose so that they don't change the House bill exactly, and have to send it back. Exactly. So in the Senate, any single member can slow things down, hold it up. They need the cooperation of every single senator in order, in, in order to move quickly on this. So what the leadership is doing is going to offer them amendment votes in exchange for their cooperation. These amendment votes will fail. Everyone knows that because if it were to pass, it would completely upset things. This is a very delicately negotiated deal. It would have to go back to the House. But they're in the process of working that out. It is just a matter of when, not if, they pass this in the Senate. We're hearing it might be sometime today, might be tomorrow, but it's going to get done hopefully before the weekend. All right, so they'll have the amendments. So, Tulu, you write an interesting post in the, Washington, in the piece in the Washington Post today. We have a Democratic president, we have a Republican speaker, and yet they negotiate a deal, and they're both in some ways winners. Now, there are some nicks on both of them from this process, but I want to read from the piece. The comments reflected an emboldened mood on the part of both men, an octogenarian Democrat who has faced questions about his age and ability to shepherd a vibrant, diverse party, and a California Republican who has been viewed as a weak leader, beholden to his conference's conservative firebrands. Uh, it is true, right? Yes, they both have some questions going forward from this, but they can both rightfully say, I win. And they are. They are. They've already started to sort of brag about this deal, say this is how Washington is supposed to work. You have to remember that President Biden has faced questions about his age, about his ability, about whether or not he should be running for re-election. And this divided government period is a test of whether or not he's going to be able to carry on uh, through the next election. And for McCarthy, he faced challenges over whether or not he should be speaker. He's been speaker for a few months, and there's this sort of sword hanging over his head uh, over whether or not he will be able to remain in his post because of uh, some of the things that he's doing that are not supported by folks on the far right. But because he, he was able to get this deal uh, and there aren't any real major calls yet for his ouster, he can claim victory over this. And so um, there will be some out there, um, and it's your job to rain on their parade, um, who would say, OK, well, you just did this. right? You just did this. Liberals are unhappy. Conservatives are unhappy. But you just came together in the broad middle of Washington just did something very important. Right. So why can't we have a conversation about immigration? Why can't we have a conversation about whether they're big health care questions, entitlements, uh, child tax credits? Not going to happen, right? Because the global economy is not going to collapse and tens of thousands, if not more, of Americans are going to lose their jobs. The U.S. isn't going to be permanently knocked off of its um, leadership post in terms of how the rest of the world mm -hmm. use it. The currency uh, as the primary currency is, is not going to be shaken. Uh, by any of those other things. The default has a singular capacity to have national and international shockwaves that will be both immediate and permanent to some degree. And Kevin McCarthy knows that, and so does most of the Republican caucus. I do think that um, this is a win for both men, but in different ways. For Biden, there was nowhere to go but down. For the president, if it had been a default, it would have been a disaster for the country, but also you know, for him. Uh, but it doesn't boost his his ratings or his standing that he managed to stave it off, I don't mm -hmm. think. For Kim McCarthy, this is really a window to, to reset uh, both his own caucus and Americans' impression of his leadership skills and of what kind of a speaker he's going to be. I don't know how far he can take that with a razor-thin majority that just at least temporarily got one smaller. Um, but, uh, but it is a, a moment for, for, the, for his caucus and for um, the political establishment and Americans to say, there might be more here than we thought there was. There are some still, to McCarthy's right, who are, he had to fight to get their votes to be speaker, what, 15 ballots back in January. Uh, there are some who are unhappy and say they will consider using their power. The part of the deal was any one member can move to vac vacate the chair. Listen to one of them, Ken Buck. 
the discussion about the motion to vacate is going to happen in the next week or two. What would your reaction be if Democrats were to step in and, and save McCarthy on oh. the motion to vacate? Vincenzo Gonzalez just told us he's open to it. It's like a, a date with a eunuch. Elaborate? Yeah. <laughs> uh, he, 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 he does not have much power when, when he uh, relies on Democrats to keep him as speaker. Is that real? meaning there will be a real challenge to McCarthy's leadership. I assume he would survive it, but it would still be a dent. Or is that just venting? We'll have to see. I mean, they have the power, a single member, to be able to at least call the vote. It would take five Republicans to actually succeed, assuming all Democrats vote against McCarthy in that scenario. Kevin McCarthy is not taking it lightly. He has to take that seriously, but he's also not sweating it. And it's because, John, as you mentioned, he has beaten back the conservative revolt before. It took him 15 ugly rounds of voting, but he eventually got there. I think what will really determine it is what members hear when they go back there to their districts, right? If they are hearing conservatives who are furious back home, they might get fired up and come back and want to proceed with this. But the fact that they are not right now committing to follow through with it, I think is probably a good sign. That's an interesting point you make about when they go home, because the leading Republican candidates for president mm -hmm. now, Trump was late to it. He waited and waited and waited, but on Iowa radio, I said, he said no. Uh, it's a safe place for if you're appealing to the Republican base is to be no. Uh, so we'll see if some of that when they go home, if they come back to Washington, if that happens. Manu, what are you hearing about how swiftly this bill could wind up on President Biden's desk? Well, this is actually the subject of intense negotiations that are happening right now on the Senate floor. I just, on my way over here, talked to the number two Republican, John Thune, who is deep in these negotiations to try to get this bill passed as soon as tonight. He is having discussions with some members on the Senate floor, including Senator Lindsey Graham and others who are demanding certain, certain things. One thing that Lindsey Graham wants is he wants some sort of insurance from Democratic leaders and Republican leaders that they will move on a Ukraine funding package sometime later this this year. There's also some concerns about defense funding and the level of defense funding in this plan. The deal that was cut between McCarthy and the White House would essentially level out funding, provide the funding that was under the Biden proposal, the Biden administration's defense spending proposal. That is not far enough for a number of these hawks on the Republican side of the aisle who believe that it needs to be much further, believe it is not kept up with the pace of inflation. And all these concerns are significant because one senator, single senators, can delay matters until past the Monday default deadline. They need to get all 100 to agree to actually schedule the vote. And at the moment, they don't have that agreement. Now, this all comes as senators are raising concerns. Lindsey Graham told me today that this deal was a bad one that was cut, and others are also uncertain about whether they're going to back this plan. This is really dumb. The people who negotiated this, I wouldn't let them buy me a car. So the speaker says that Democrats didn't get any wins here. Uh, well, I tell you what, a lot of them believe they did because more Democrats voted for it than Republicans. What does that say to you? I know in divided government is tough, but don't tell me that this is the best we could do. The party of Ronald Reagan is in jeopardy. This is really dumb. This is the wrong way to address the debt. It's just the wrong way. It uh, empowers the folks on the far right. And quite frankly, I don't think they have the best interest of the country in mind. And uh, I don't think, I haven't talked to anybody that's enamored with this deal. So there are concerns on the left that believe the White House gave too much to the Speaker, concerns on the right that the Speaker gave too much to the White House. But there's also no doubt about this. There is expectation that this will pass eventually, maybe tonight, maybe tomorrow. Senators are begrudgingly voting for a compromise they don't love, but they realize this is the only way to avoid a default. Yeah, bipartisan disdain for this bill. It seems that's a sign of a compromise. Manu Raju live on Capitol Hill. Thanks so much. And Brianna, this is more than just about raising the debt ceiling. This has implications far and wide. Yeah, certainly if passed into law, the bipartisan debt deal would prevent the Biden administration from extending the federal student loan payment pause that began in 2020 during the Trump administration. The bill reads that the pause shall cease to be effective 60 days after June 30th, and that would mean that roughly 44 million people will have to resume making payments on their loans. And there is some concern if this process is going to go smoothly, as you can imagine. There are so many people who may be confused about how much they owe, when to pay, how they're going to pay, especially when you consider this, that 2 million borrowers will have a different servicer handling their loans since the last time that they made a payment. In the meantime, 
All eyes are going to be on the Supreme Court. Justices could rule as early as this month on a separate student loan forgiveness program. And under the Biden administration proposal, individual borrowers who made less than $125,000 in either 2020 or 2021, and also married couples or heads of households who made less than $250,000 per year, they would qualify for up to $10,000 of their federal student loan debt being forgiven. And if a borrower got a Pell Grant in college, if they got a Pell Grant in college, that individual is eligible for up to 20 grand in debt forgiveness. If the Supreme Court allows this program to take effect, it's possible the government moves quickly to forgive the debts of 16 million borrowers who are already approved for relief. If the justices strike down Biden's student loan forgiveness program, the administration could make some modifications. They could try again, but that, of course, could take months, Jim.